Hello, can I start singing now? Yes. Uh, so I'm really, really thankful for you to be here. I know that the last two days and nights have been quite hard. So yeah, it says a lot of you that you are here. Probably the best way would have been to give like Red Bulls, like there at the entrance, <laughs> but ha that might have been a little bit extreme. So, but I really hopefully help to wake you up uh, by sharing some ingredients for SEO success in 2015. I am super excited to be here. I am learning a lot, a lot, a lot, and that is much more of why can I say, because I always go to search marketing type of even SEO, much more SEO focused, and of course, hearing so much and learning so much about conversion optimization and, and list building, it's like very, very impressive. I, I, I have loved it. This is myself, I have been already presented, so I'm just going to skip, but if you want, you can follow me, of course, uh, that never hurts. Uh, so let's talk about SEO success ingredients. And every time that I talk about SEO um, in front of a not necessarily SEO audience, I always like to clarify. This is not, these are not the ingredients that I'm talking about. <laughs> Definitely no. Uh, these are toxic. Whenever I think of spam already or anything that can sound like a shortcut or um, focusing on how to make the most out of the weaknesses of Google, mainly most of the days for us. At the end of the day, is is a little bit of uh, food and meat for today, and advance a lot today, and hungry, a lot of hunger for 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 tomorrow, right? The thing is that spam comes in a diff in a lot of different flavors, even like yum. You think, oh my god, that should be good. It's bacon, right? It's like spamish bacon. Nah, it's still spam. I mean. Uh, we need to be careful because at the end of the day, even if I know that many of us are in very competitive industries and it is appalling sometimes that um, we don't necessarily, and we stick to good practices and, and we, we make sure that we don't go against any guidelines, but still like that, the, the bad guys, those who still manipulating the, 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 the search functionalities and, and, and focus on, on, on how to exploit these opportunities are still ahead of us, uh, at some point that happens, it happens, Google catch up, right? So that's, spam is not necessarily a manipulation, it's not necessarily a real SEO exp uh, ingredient, right? Uh, it's not a part of a long-term SEO success. I want to improve the yumminess over time. So the ingredients for this yumminess is that I want to focus about this. The hard work, the implementation, uh, the tactics that you need to implement for, and for which you will see results, yeah, after a few months. Maybe you don't feel so much of a badass or, or cool ninja because it's a lot of work, right? But it pay off. And then you will be able to sleep well at night and you will be able to eat something yummy over time and not this crap with nasty consequences sometimes. It's very, very, very hard. And you see, you, when you are there, you think, oh, I am this badass spammer, SEO manipulator or whatever, like I am outsmarting Google so much. So many black hats at some point have said that. And then, oh shit, we're doomed. I shouldn't have focused myself on black hat tactics, whatever. So, right? So, once that I have clarified that, we are going to focus on the good ingredients and the good stuff to increase the yumminess over time and have a long term strategy that will pay off at some point with hard work. And Again, just to clarify, uh, the SEO has been ar around already for a while, uh, but the most of the topics cover whether the relevance of the popularity that we need to achieve in order to improve our rankings, to increase our rankings, right? Uh, in our mind, SEO is like my rankings need to go up so I can get more clicks, more traffic, more conversions. That's it, and, and, and my, my rankings go up because of the relevance of my content and the popularity of my pages. That's it, it's like, yeah, the content analysis that Google does and then how they assess links, as endorsements, and if I have a lot of external links, good links, relevant links, my rankings will improve, right? So uh, this is okay, but it's just the fundamental nowadays, really, mainly because SERPs, search, search engine result pages, are not like this anymore. These pages have stopped to exist more and more over time, and now search results are like this. We have snippets, we have the knowledge graph, we have apps ranking. Um, results are multi-device, 
So we don't necessarily always see top 10 pages ranking in the first page. We have maps, we have local, we have no, uh, uh, rich snippets based on structured markup. So we have many functionalities because of how Google has been evolving lately in the last years and it has never stopped and it's likely not going to stop right now necessarily. And how the, the user also has improved and changed the behavior of how they are searching for information to, that has to do a lot. You, you, you can take a look. Um, I love what Moss has put together here, uh, showing all the different functionalities and, and, and features that search results are, are featuring nowadays. And you can see it's quite a lot. And there, is, there are less and less search results not showing anything, only the top 10 results, page results. So at the end of the day, we realize that in order to have SEO results, it's not only about improving our rankings anymore, but about improving our visibility which is different because in the past, the only way to improve visibility was ranking better. We knew about the click to rate. We knew that 33% or so of people will click on the first results, but that has changed with all of these features. You can see how much visibility of a second ranking page is higher than the one ranking first, just because of the features they are showing, because of the rich snippets, because they are showing on the maps, because the type of device used, Sometimes it's like this. So we need to focus and identify opportunities to improve our visibility, which doesn't necessarily imply sometimes to even getting better rankings necessarily. So what we need to realize is that at the end of the day, our goal is to connect with our relevant audience, with our potential users, along the overall customer journey, because a lot of people in SEO also come from the, a much more technical world, and they focus only on the transactional type of queries, like buy this, uh, download this, register this, and they forget completely that people search for stuff before making decision on buying, and search for stuff afterwards to get support. And these are also opportunities for them to establish uh, the visibility in, in search results. So we need to acknowledge this. And whether whatever is, is, is our final goal, of, or, um, to sell, to educate, to communicate, to establish our branding, etc., to give support, to provide support to our users. What is important is that we don't forget about this very specific vision that we will have now with SEO, is to improve visibility, to be there when my audience needs me, right, when they are looking for me. So let's see the specific key ingredients nowadays, the ones that were not typical necessarily, like a few years ago, and the ones that you can make sure to start focusing right now in order to improve this overall visibility in, 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 in the next future. So one of the first thing was to think about keyword research in a much more broader, competitive, strategic way. When I do keyword research nowadays, I just don't focus on, on, on the volume, the search volume for the, the keywords and, and who are ranking first and second and the competitors that I will have and the relevant towards my, my content and offering and, 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 and uh, business model anymore, but I focus on how I can really improve my visibility with these type of terms and if it makes sense and when they are searched, from which devices they are searched, which are the functionalities that are shown in these search results, how come I can identify opportunities to improve my visibility with them, really. So it's about, yes, relevance, volume, profitability of these keywords, the trend, the seasonality, the intent of these queries, and also how I can identify opportunities with uh, low competition per devices and also features and functionalities in search results that can help me improve my, my visibility. And based on that is that I won't only identify the type of terms that I need to target to get my results that I want, but really the format of the content, the type of content, uh, where that content should be placed, how it should be distributed because of the way the users search for it. And at the beginning, there's always this big challenge. When we start with a new industry in SEO, how do I identify my real competitors? Because a lot of people come to me and say, oh, I like that. I don't really have competitors. I, I'm a startup and I do this that is quite new and nobody else does it. In, yeah, but somebody else is already ranking for those queries where you really want to be, the queries that your audience are already searching for. So th those are your search competitors. So go and find them. I I'm going to go and find them for you because those are the ones that we are going to outrank and where we are going to 
improve our visibility for and, 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 and decrease there, right? So we can use similar web to start identifying uh, which are my industry and country competitors specifically. Uh, we want to use, besides similar web, SEMrush, for example, to identify the keywords for which they are ranking for and identify opportunities. How many of these websites are targeting these or those keywords? Which are the type of terms that are not being quite targeted from there, from themselves yet? And I want to compare this with my own. So I go to Google Master Tools that has been lately renamed to the Search Console, console and, and identify for which queries I am already attracting a lot of visibility, a lot of clicks, which are giving me a lot of visibility, but not necessarily a good click-through rate. Hmm, why? Which type of content I am using to, to, to rank for these keywords, right? How can I improve this? I need to start identifying these opportunities in, the, in, in this way. And again, which type of device and, and what type of search result if providing me this type of visibility. For example, it can be a web search, or it can be an image search, or it can be a map search. I, I need to understand this in a much better way. I can, so, I can also use tools like Keyword Tool IO, which has a, a, a free version, to generate a lot of permutation to identify much more of long tail type of, of, of potential possibilities to run for, in case that I still don't have so much authority to go for the most competitive term, right? And, and then to use this New functionalities, for example, homepage has this TF, IDF analysis to identify some thematically related topics around the keywords that I want to rank for, uh, the, the ones that I, that I want to, to target. So they provide me synonyms, alternatives that are not necessarily that obvious and are never going to be generated by typical keyword research tools, right? So once that I do it, I have all these keywords on terms ideas. I go and validate the search volume and the trend as seasonality. In, in Google Keyword Planner. And one of the things that I would choose always is to see what's the percentage of the searches that are coming from mobile devices. Because the big uh, mistake that we're still doing in SEO is thinking on the desktop search results, when sometimes for a lot of different industry, the, the, the mobile focused type of searches are really, really high, 30 something percent, 40, 14 percent. So I focus on these, and when I go and track my rankings, I won't do it for desktop, I will do it for mobile. And I know that it's there where I will have much more possibility to, to attract much more traffic and conversion relevant for my site. There's this little tool that I love because it, it saves so much work. It provides me not only with uh, keyword suggestions, but the trend at the same time, and the top 10 websites ranking for them right there to, to analyze and compare my own popularity and authority versus theirs. Uh, and of course, the most keyword difficulty tool. And for example, when I enter two terms, for example, in this case, you can see here how I identified that personal trainer Manchester is 720 searches per month, and then Manchester gym is only uh, half of it, uh, almost 480, right? But then when I go to this tool, it's coincidentally, I realized that the term that has a lower search volume has a higher competition. Hmm, how interesting is that? And, and then I found out that some of the pages that are ranking for these search results are ranking with maps. You can see it up there. These are not necessarily the top 10 blue links, right? I go and I validate the search like this, and they look like this. So which one I will target? Which one will give me much more opportunities to get much more visibility and to rank easily, much more easily? The one that has the higher search volume, likely, and lower and, lo and lower competition, and where I can probably try to rank with Google local search not results, not necessarily with the with the uh, organic ones right away. And like this, I will find many other opportunities to rank with ad reviews, rank with videos, rank with images, with news, etc., etc., etc. So what is important is to do an inventory of my own content, and then again, an inventory of the SERP profiles that are really likely providing me the, the opportunities to rank uh, for relevant, for relevant keywords, for relevant uh, queries in, 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 in my sector. And then again, what on mobile? I need to do the same and validate this on mobile to identify that, uh, just to validate that I'm not missing something very, very big. And target this type of SERPs and queries with different type of, of, of search, um, transactional, informational, uh, 
for products, areas, whatever news, I need to go through all these validations to identify which are the ones that are going to be worthy for me. And this is an example of this. You will say, oh, Lalita, this is so silly, this is so basic. But this website that I have been ranked for, I have been able to get, look, 12,000 clicks, which are visits in this case in the search console uh, from image search, just because we identify that these are properties, really, and a lot of these properties in search results were being shown with a stripe of image in Google search results. So I say, well, why don't we go for them? We will never run first result because property market is also very high level, and it ended up happening. We identified those, that opportunity, we optimized the images very well. Three or of the five images here are, are from the site that we are ranking with, and of course you can see, okay, LA, that is only eight clicks for an image. Yeah, but you can see, it's the aggregation of that. It's a long tail type of, of, of strategy and we get 12,000 that is not bad at all from this type of searches. And of course, these are not necessarily transactional type of queries or, or, or the best way to convert at the end of the day uh, in a much more straightforward way. But it gives us opportunities to interact with the user across the customer journey and provide our content. And that can be tasty for sure. That can establish and, and provide an opportunity for us and, and give much more ideas and, and opportunities and, and ways to rank and to connect with our users. Then once we have established these goals, how do we know really, really, really nowadays which are those aspects that we need to take care of in order to improve our indexability, crawlability, that, that, that is much more likely that Google would identify well our, our, our content. We know that, for example, mobile finally boomed last year. Google has started already to take it as a search ranking factor. And this is crazy. For example, these are websites that I, that I manage. And you can see these are not even in, in the technical sector. And they have 30% uh, of, of, search, of, of, of search traffic coming from, from mobile devices. These are in the local business. And of course, we search a lot on the go. For, for local type of queries, right? And th those, these are for technology sites. And you can see, it's, it's crazy, it's booming. I have already more searches happening from, from mobile devices than from desktop itself. This is important. It's a very, very important ingredient nowadays. And even more because Google has already started taking into consideration as a ranking factor. So when we go and crawl our website and we do an audit, it's so, so important that we don't only do it with the default search crawler the one for desktop, but we go and configure everything to validate and crawl our site, understand how Google is identifying our site content from a mobile version too. Even if we don't have a mobile version, even if we have one, a desktop one, we want to understand how the mobile search bot is identifying this content, if they are identifying it well at all. So crawling efficiency is something, something so important, especially with big sites. And this is a huge issue. You can see I, I have, for example, 127 URLs that I have called here, and, and uh, 46,000 of them are not showing 200 HTTP status. That means that they are whether redirected to other ones, 301, 302 redirects, or showing errors right directly. And others have no index. So there are 17,000 that are no indexable pages. I want to avoid this at all costs, and I will make sure that the internal linking of this website is improved so they really go to these pages where the meat is, the, where the original content that should be identified by the search bot is. I don't want to Google to lose time by going through all these shitty pages that are duplicated, that are redirected, that are showing errors. That's not efficient. That, that's not making the most out of their time and definitely not helping them access in a much positive way our content. This for huge sites is so, so, so important. And you will say, oh, Aleida, this is so basic. And I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you some examples, shocking examples from mobile. So this is what I meant before. Whether you use deep crawl on page, there are so many craw crawlers uh, nowadays. Screaming Frog, you can see here, it's very easy to select the mobile crawler to crawl your site. And when you do, you will see, oh my God, there are so many shitty optimized pages in mobile. But very, very basic. Take a look, next, the mobile version, they have blocked the all M subdomain. 
all of their mobile version is blocked. You will say, oh, we already have a mobile version. We don't need to do anything else. Oh, at least leave Google to crawl <laughs> and to identify the information on your, mobile, on your mobile version. This is what happens. Goes down. Of course, the, the, the new search update targeting mobile of Google came, and this happened. They lost a lot of traffic. Eh, you should have removed that robust TXT block in your, your, your mobile version, right? It's pretty straightforward. For some reason, we forget about the basics with mobile. And watch out for interstitial. They might cause also crawling issues, indexing issues. If you want to recommend your mobile app or other type of content related, you can do this with the smart banners. Less intrusive, the same effect. I have done it in the past. It hasn't increased. And also, there are all the many ways nowadays that we are going to see to recommend your app content. You don't need to forget about your navigation when you're on mobile, because I see that there are so many minimalistic mobile web versions nowadays that they don't even include any links, only the search box. But Google is not able to crawl towards that, behind that. So it's important that you still have this type of menus, too. And always remember that you need to redirect your users and the search crawler, too, to the relevant mobile version. For example, I go to Flickr here, the mobile version, from my desktop, and I am not redirected towards the desktop version. I'm pretty sure that sometimes when someone shares a link to you and they are on a mobile and they send, they send you the, 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 the mobile version, you open it on your desktop and it doesn't redirect. It's so bad. Imagine the crawler, they are not able to see the right content in that case. So when you do an audit like this, you will be able to find so many of these little quick wings that if you identify and fix, it will improve so much. Again, crawling Flickr, the mobile version, and you can see all the titles there. They say Flickr, Flickr, Flickr. You go to the desktop page and they feature the relevant name of each photo as it should. You know, and if, like that for every, every page. And this happens with a lot of other websites. They forget about the basics with mobile. So you go and you validate uh, with the mm, Google Mobile tool, the validator, and then Chrome has this feature. Uh, the, it, it's called the, 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 uh, the developer device feature or something like that in, with Chrome that you can select and you can browse uh, emulating any mobile device that you choose. It's right there in your, in your uh, Chrome browser for you to verify. And what we need to be aware is that although Google in the past has pushed so much for um, responsive web design, it's not true that responsive web design is the only way to make your mobile website optimized for Google. That is their preferred way just because it's easier for them. They just need to crawl once and index once because you are showing one page, one URL in one content, and you reformat it with CSS and media queries, and that's it. You just need to enable for them to, to, to identify the GS and the CSS that you're using and the images, but not much more. The other alternative to in enable uh, dynamic serving, showing through the same URL different HTMLs, depending on the, on the type of device and the type of crawler that comes, might be trickier to implement initially technically, but, but might be much more straightforward for you and better to personalize the overall experience of the user with that uh, device. Uh, Optim really optimize the uh, mobile version, focus on each device, really. Because the problem nowadays is that with responsive, we try just to change the, the sizes. And at the end of the day, the content is the same. We just overlay it. We just, we just try to reorganize it in a way that is not so bad. The performance is hurt. The restrictions that we have on mobile are really are different. And then we have the independent mobile side. We enable everything under, on, under an M subdomain on our M sub subdirectory. And what we need to take care of is to tag very well these pages with canonical and red alternate some tags that Google provides for this so they can understand the relationship between them and they are not content duplicated pages. I have written a, a post about this in Search Engine Land that you can check out with a full process to follow. Uh, and what I wanted just to clarify here is that it's important to understand that Responsive is not necessarily the only way, as sometimes people think. And, and Google won't assess you in a better way just because your website is responsive. It's not true. And now that we are talking about mobile, let's talk about app indexing. I really, really think that this is the next 
huge thing. And a lot of people, uh, last April when the, the mobile update happened, they say, oh, mobile get on. A lot of websites are going to be unranked if, if they are, don't have the mobile version ready, whatever. It didn't happen as much as a lot of people thought, but it did happen. But the other announcement that happened around the time that nobody cared about, sadly, was this one. Google was not only able to identify the content of your apps if you implemented uh, the, the different guidelines that they, they are sharing initially for Android now, also for iOS apps, but they are also taking that content into consideration in search results to recommend you apps, even if you don't have them installed. So if someone comes and searches something relevant about your business and you have an app related an index and connected to your web, Google will show your app icon and will allow the user to open and install the app directly from search results. How cool is that? It's, it's super nice because at the end of the day, a lot of people and lot of businesses he sees much more engagement from their app version, from their app presence. So you ref cross refer in this sense from your mobile web and your mobile app, and that is the other way. Why you don't need to be intrusive? You just need to implement this well, and you will see the results. So here you have a, a guidelines to do it. So it can be a little bit complex at the beginning. I did it with one of my clients, and it was a lot of trial and error at the beginning. And then it's when Google started to document this much more. They have already technical requirements very well specified, a checklist to go through when you do this. They now have tools to verify and validate this in a much more straightforward way that you can check that if you are really connecting well to your app versus your web content. And at the end of the day, this is another way to maximize the search visibilities and opportunities that you will have, not only with your website in, in search results, but also with your app. This is very, very cool. And another thing that we need to be very careful on nowadays is with JavaScript heavy websites. This infinite scroll, 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 scroll. That is so popular nowadays, and people love it, and they say, oh my god, it's so intuitive, and it improves the experience of my users, but the reality is that this beautiful website can is seen like this by search bots. Search bots are evolving, but they are still like a little bit of like a dummy users in this sense. They are getting there little by little. And then I got, the, you know, this is a page that I saw that it was Jason Fried, who shared on Twitter. And he's like, oh, this is so, just a beautiful page that these guys have launched. And then like Dan Schur, who is an SEO, who I, I know him, who was like, uh, yeah, too bold that Google doesn't see it. And I don't fucking care that Google doesn't see it. The problem is that people won't be able to find it when they search for this business in Google. That is the sad thing. So this doesn't have to do with the argument that, oh, I am optimizing for user experience. I don't optimize it for, for Google, for a bot but they don't realize that the bot is only your bridge toward the people. So if you really want to challenge your content to reach and achieve the results, the final goal to connect with people and get much more audience to your website, do this. Because this is another channel that you are going to lose if you do this. It's very, very sad. And also, there's new excuse. Google published last year infinite scroll good practices and SEO recommendation, how you can use push dates in some ways and implement it in some ways. And there are even templates there that you can use. So really, if a developers come with this type of arguments to me, I say, like, you're lazy, man. You don't really like to, to give the extra mile and validate and research to do your job and your work as best in the possible way for your client, right? Because this is so much straightforward nowadays. No excuse. If you have any doubts with your own content, you can go and verify the cache version of your page there, in that option in the search results directly, or you can go to the Google Master Tools and identify this option right there that is fetch as Google Bot, and you will see exactly what the Google Bot see and what the user see, and if there is any difference, if there's clocking happening, if there is a script that is blocking the rest of your content, and you will be able to say, okay, I am providing my content in the best possible way. And another thing that happens with so many scripts on our page and showing content with this is that our performance, our page's performance are hurt. And here is a very, very you know, descriptive and, and, and graphic example of how my crawl website start to fall when the, my pages start to have a higher size. It's much more difficult 
for Google to identify much more content if they need to process more each time of each page in order to find more content. So at the end of the day, they won't be able sometimes to crawl all of the websites, all of the journal pages that I have on my website. It's very, very sad. I want them to see it all. I need to improve my performance. So I go to Google Analytics. There is this report showing which are the top pages of your site. You can apply any segments there, the organic, uh, per device, whatever. And it will provide you the, the, the information about the average load time. It connects directly with the recommendation of page speed insights. And this tool is so actionable. Again, GT Metrics is two. They tell you directly, externalize your JavaScript, minimize this GS and this CSS, do this, do that. There's no excuse to have pages that take so long to load that the performance is crap. This is spicy for sure. There is a lot of meat going on there. And then, from a semantic perspective, what happens? Google has evolved so much. And it's now, a, really, it's, 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 it's a answer engine. It's not really a search engine. It's an answer engine. They, they are semantically evolving so much. At some point in the future, I really believe they are going to become one of the first AI, for sure. You can identify this with this type of queries. When you search for Christopher Nolan movies, you get the answers right there. You don't need to go to any other websites. How to buy a, a house? <laughs> Google, funnily, they literally scrap internal pages content, they provide the, the answer right there. You don't even need to go to the content. A lot of websites don't like this, by the way, understandably. And they, how to buy a house? Don't buy a house. <laughs> that is the first step. That's, you, you're very smart, Google. Thank you very much. And, and really, it has become an answer, an, an answer engine. You can see here, like, for how to become an astronaut, how to be happy, fake it until you make it. That's, that's very handy too, Google. Thank you very much. But realistically, it is advancing. So. They, they can become very clever if they want. Like, how to install Internet Explorer? And, and the answer they provide is how to uninstall Internet Explorer. They know better than us, for sure. They are getting there. So Google is, yeah, at some point, becoming also a little bit of an aggregator itself. And uh, at the final destination, the answer machine, not necessarily the search machine. Huh. But how, in the meantime, we can make the moves out of it? How we can optimize our knowledge graph and make sure that we give best and, and make, maximize the image of our, of our companies, of our brands there with all these functionalities that they have. Well, we can personalize the logo, the company contact numbers, and the social profiles of our knowledge graph results, like the one that HubSpot has here, just by using microdata, just by using schema, in this case with JSON. They give us the examples right there in this guide, and we are going to be able to optimize for that also with rich snippets. You want to show the reviews. You want to show the, the different type of icons of our content, products, recipes, reviews. They provide us here the information right away. The same if we want to configure our search box, the internal search box that sometimes is shown now in the Silex area when some, someone searches for our brand. You can do it like this. They are showing it how to do it. And it's important to do it because otherwise, when someone, so for example, searches for Airbnb and then search with this little feature there that will go and that will be taken to another Google search page that will be showing ads for Airbnb competitors. That's not very good. You need to take control of it. And how do you take control? Configuring this feature very well so Google goes and shows the results in your own internal pages, how it should be done, right? Take control of that image and don't let Google to take advantage of it to show ads of other, of other players out there that might be your competitors. Here are tools to validate this free to use completely. Google itself has one, and that is soft. And finally, how do you monitor this, measure all this, that you are going very well? OK, of course, Google and Master Tool, the search console, is very, very straightforward. Unfortunately, the problem with this is that it only shows the last 90 days. So there is this script, use it, to download and archive your data automatically, with the top pages, the top queries. Otherwise, it can be tricky to, to measure and to look what you were doing one year ago. I have created this guide also that you can use URL provider to have the top queries, the two pages ranking for these queries, how they are optimized, integrating uh, screaming frog data, what is their traffic data for each one of these pages. So you can verify, mm, these are well optimized, but for, reason, for some reason they are not converting that well. Even the spies I have a really good ranking, but the click-through rate is really low on one Excel sheet like this. Very, very easy to do this type of analysis. And you have it there. I, I did it for mobile, too. You can 
you can segment this a lot, and URL providers are really, really nice to that allows you to do this super easily. You should stop tracking rankings. You should start ra uh, tracking the overall SERPs, which are the top 10, top 20 results for each query that I want to target, which are the places that are moving up or down. Now that I am moving up, which is the one that is going down because I am going up? Who's my, yeah, who I am over ranking? What, it, what are the characteristics of the page? The popularity, the, the optimization, et, et cetera. You can use Serwoop for this. This is super easy to use and provide you the overall view of what is happening in your sector, as well as allow you to, sh uh, to track the, volali the, the volatility of any industry. And this is super, super useful when you don't know what is, if there is an update going on, and then you see, oh, there's an update. Look, yeah, there's a lot of volatility going on in my country for my sector. Mm -hmm. Something is happening, I need to track better, monitor better my pages. And finally, you want to set alerts to be notified when every, anything changes. If your organic traffic goes down, you want to be sent an alert via SMS or via WhatsApp. I want to know when that happens. So I have written again another, another post here, State of Digital, uh, sharing different IFT recipes that you can use along Google Analytics and, and, and other tools in order to be alerted when something goes bad, when there is a new link for your competitor, when someone mentions your brand, so many, so many opportunities there to be proactive and, and to be connected of what is happening on your site. That was quick. So it's delicious. There, there can be a lot more opportunities out there besides the typical ones that you likely already know in SEO. It's exciting. A lot of things are happening. Thank you very much. All right, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, where do you see SEO going with respect to uh, Siri and other similar services? Yeah, um, more and more, uh, Google is providing ways to personalize your cards for Android to, in order to improve also the visibility that you provide with this type of, of voice search results. Um, it's, it's, it's funny because I, the, the examples that I had provided for, for the knowledge graph with the, with the results, with the answers, shown there, I have, you know, just, just because of, of it was easier for me, I provided examples on the desktop. But the way that Google really has to promote them is via voice search from your mobile. Search for whatever, like how many calories has the apple pie that I am just about to eat? 500, oh, bad. So it's like that. So I see that this is going to have much, much, much more visibility and weight. And the way that we really will have to connect with this type of, of results and to improve our visibility with them will be, again, with the knowledge graph and, and with structured markup and with semantic search. At the end of the day, there will become a day that Google becomes the answer engine and likely not necessarily even take the user to our site. Uh, so we need to be aware of, of that, uh, but also make the most out of the opportunity and our visibility with, with these type of searches too. But it is happening. But of course, uh, the first step is to have a mobile optimized website. The second step is likely to have also an app. The, first, uh, the third step is to make the most out of structured markup and, and be very well optimized for the knowledge graph. You should. Oh, I, I, was, I was speaking for Google now, sorry. <laughs> well, yes, yes, sorry, I was speaking, I was speaking about Google uh, uh, and, and the engine that they are using is Google now, and then Microsoft is using Cortana, and then, yes, for Siri, it's for, for Apple-based uh, iOS type of results. The thing is, Apple has even, and it's good that you, that you mentioned this, because, again, when someone speaks about search, I think of Google right there. But Apple has um, a lot of new type of feature, and they have even a crawler now. It is known that they are crawling the web uh, and, and, and their own apps too, and they have their app's own control, of course. And it's true, more and more people is using Siri on the go, on mobile. This doesn't happen with desktop searches, but again, People are switching from desktop to mobile. So it is very interesting because the other day, there were a lot of, with the Apple announcement, there were a lot of announcements going on on how they are crawling the web and, and, and also the, the, there were some patterns going on that they are, they are filled, they have filled regarding search. Uh, so they are going to become a much more 
potential and, and heavyweight type of, of player on mobile. Right now, I would say the, the search engine that provides us real functionalities to be able to index our content, whether mobile or, or app is Google still. Right now, there is not a way to, to optimize for, for Siri, for example, or Cortana, but there will become a time that we need to be alert for that. Because if really Apple is able to provide a good, really good experience and, and, and really facilitate the tool so web people can easily optimize all this for their own apps and, and webs, it can very well become the competition for Google and overcome Google Now at some point or even represent a, a, a real competitor there. Like the one being has never been for Google, for example. It's like, yeah, opportunity they haven't. Maybe Apple is able to do that at some point. Not right now, but yes, in the future, surely. Thank you, Alida. You're welcome.